Good day, students. Welcome to today's chemistry session. Today's topic is on chemical bonding. Introduction. When atoms interact for bond formation, only the outermost part of the atoms are in contact, and so only the outer electrons in the outermost shell are involved. The outermost shell electron arrangement is therefore very important in determining the type of bond objective. At the end of this lesson, the student will be able to explain electrovalent and covalent bonding, list properties of electrovalent and covalent and covalent compounds, state octet rule, explain metallic bonding, and explain dipole-dipole interaction. Now, electrovalent bonding. Electrovalent bonding involves electron transfer from the valence shell of one atom to the valence shell of the other. One atom loses electrons to become positively charged and the other gains electrons to become negatively charged. The positively and negatively charged ions are called cations and anions respectively. The, the ionic bond results from the attraction between these oppositely charged ions. This type of bond is usually between metals and non-metals. <clears throat> the loss and gain of electrons result in inert, configu inert configuration for cation and anion, except for helium, which is true. The inert gas configuration corresponds to eight electrons in the outer, in the outer shell. The electronic theory of valency as postulated by Kossil and Lewis in 1716 was prompted by the remarkable stability of the rare gas element. This stability is associated with the presence in the atoms of a group of eight electrons in the outer shell. This completeness appears to be the source of stability in rare gases. The tendency for atoms to have eight electrons in the outermost shell is explained by the octet rule. The octet rule states that atom tends to gain or lose electron until there are eight electrons in their valence shell. Properties of electrovalent bonding or compound. Electrovalent compounds contain electrovalent bonds. The properties are as follows. They are usually crystalline solids. Number two, generally soluble in water, but generally insoluble in organic solvent like ethers or kerosene. They are usually they usually have high melting points. They are good conductors of electricity when molten or in aqueous solution, but not when solid. Now let's quickly go to covalent bonding. This type of bonding involves sharing of electron pairs rather than complete transfer. The shared electrons are contributed by the two atoms involved in the bonding. The binding force results from the attraction of the shared electron pairs by the, nu by the nuclei of the atoms involved in the bonding. This type of bond is between non-metals. An electron pair that is two electrons constitutes a bond and two pairs constitute a double bond as in oxygen molecule. The number of electron pairs shared depend on the number of electrons each atom must share to attain an inert gas configuration. Covalent compounds form molecules and depending on the intermolecular forces between the molecules, they may be gas that is oxygen gas, hydrogen gas, hydrochloride, hydrogen chloride gas, or liquid, as in bromine, bromine and or water, or low boiling solids such as candle wax. <laughs> now, properties of covalent compounds or bond. Covalent compounds are now they can have they are mostly liquids or gases. Number two is that they are ge they generally have low melting point when they are solids. Number three, they are generally not very soluble in water. Number four, they are generally soluble in organic solvents, 
such as benzene and they are non-conductors of heat and electricity unless they dissolve to form ions. For example, hydrogen chloride, aqueous. Thank you. I'll see you for the next class. Welcome back. Now we move on to coordinate covalent bonding. This is also known as dative covalent bonding. Now, in a covalent bond, the shared electrons are donated and controlled by both atoms that are involved in the bonding. This is not the case with coordinate covalent bond. One atom donates the electron pairs, but both atoms control the donated pairs. Once a coordinate covalent bond is formed, it is not different from ordinary covalent bond. The electron pairs is attracted by both nuclei of the bonded atom. For this type of bond to be formed, one atom must have a lone pair of electron. Lone pairs are electron pairs that are not used in the bonding. For example, ammonia having one lone pair of electron when all the three hydrogen atoms have been bonded to the nitrogen. Now, the other atoms must have a vacancy in its valence shell to accept the lone pair. The bond formation also results in the inert gas configuration for both atoms. Now, let's take an example when ammonia reacts with an hydrogen ion. So, the hydrogen ion attaches itself to the lone pairs. Now, we should now note that the positive charge is now controlled by the entire molecule. Coordinate covalent bonding is common with metal complexes. The molecules donating the electron pairs are called ligands, are called ligands, and the metal ion, the central atom. Now, for example, in the formation of ammonia complexes with cobalt ion in solution, we will find out that six ammonium is attached to the cobalt ion and the cobalt ion forms the central atom. Now, let's move on to the next bonding, which is metallic bonding. Metals usually have one, two, or three electrons in their valence shell. For example, lithium is having two one, that is one S2, two S1. In metallic bonding, each metal, each metal atom contributes its valence electron to form a cloud or sea of delocalized electrons. These electrons do not belong to any particular metal atom, but will circulate freely through the metal lattice. The, ele the electrostatic attraction between the positive cores that forms the metal lattice and the sea or clouds of electrons constitutes the metallic bonding. The above explanation of metallic bonding implies that the lattice forms a single large crystal. These account for the high strength of metals. There is no direction to metallic bonding and so the metallic lattice can be distorted easily by hammering and drawing that is malleability and ductility. The free moving electrons conduct heat and electricity by their movement. Now, the strength of metallic bond depends on the attraction of the electron cloud to the positive cause in the metal lattice. The metallic bond strength increases with the number of valence electrons in each metal contributes into the electron cloud. Now, we take for example like magnesium. Magnesium is having 282, sodium is having 281. Now, we'll find here that Sodium is softer metal than magnesium because for sodium, only one valence electron per atom. But for magnesium, two electrons are donated per atom to the electron cloud. So following the above argument, compare the strength of the with following the, uh, the above argument, compare the strength of the metallic bonding in magnesium with that in aluminium 13. Now you will find out that for metals in the same group of the periodic table, metallic strength decreases down the group. The increase in atomic size down the group is not accompanied by any increase in electron cloud strength. Now, 
The properties of metal are, are explained by the metallic bonding. Now, the properties of metal are as follows. One, they have high tensile strength. Number two, they are malleable and ductile. Number three, they are conductor of heat and electricity. And number four is that they have a high density and they are also solid at room temperature, except for mercury that is liquid at room temperature. And lastly, they usually have a shiny surface and that is luster. And so we pause here and so we'll go to the next class when we meet again. Thank you. Welcome back. Now we go into intermolecular bonding. The ionic and covalent bond represent very strong interactions between atoms in a compound. In addition to these bonds, there are other weaker attractive forces that exist between atoms and molecules. The existence of these weak attractive forces explains a number of physical properties of some compound. Because these forces are usually between molecules, they are called intermolecular forces. For example, Van der Waal forces, dipole-dipole attraction, and hydrogen bonding. Now we go to Van der Waal forces. Van der Waal forces exist between uncombined atoms and non-polar molecules. A non-polar molecule is one in which the electron pair for bonding is equally shared by the atoms involved in the bond formation. Examples of non-polar molecules are nitrogen, chlorine, etc. That is, covalent bond between two identical atoms is a non-polar bond. Non-polar bond may also exist between unlike atoms if they have the same electronegativity. For example, carbon oxide. The movement of electrons around an atom can lead to a moment can lead to a momentary shift of more electrons to one side of the molecule than the other. During this shift, an imbalance in charge exists with one side of the molecule slightly positive and the other slightly negative. The positive end will attract the negative end of another molecule close to it. This attraction constitutes a bond. This attractive force may be strong, but because it is for short time, it is, its effect is generally very small. Note, the magnitude of this force increases with increasing number of electrons. For example, fluorine, chlorine are gases. Bromine is a liquid, while iodine is a solid. Van der Waal forces is sometimes called induced dipole, induced dipole attraction. Number two, dipole, dipole attraction. Now, covalent bonding between atoms of different elements will result in a polar bond. The shared electron pair will be more under the control of more electronegative atom. Take for example, hydrogen chloride gas, HCl. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. The shared pair of electron is controlled by more by chlorine. The chlorine end of the molecule will be slightly negative and the hydrogen end slightly positive. The positive end of one hydrogen chloride molecule will attract the negative end of another molecule. This is dipole-dipole attraction. Though dipole-dipole interactions are not substantial as full ion-to-ion interaction, they are stronger than Van der Waal forces. So dipole-dipole force of attraction between opposite charge ends of polar molecules then the strength of the dipole force is dependent on the polarity of the molecule. Now, the dipole-dipole interaction accounts for the normal boiling point of covalent compound. Dipole interactions are only about 1% as strong as covalent and ionic bonds. Now, finally, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is a special type of dipole-dipole interaction which occurs when hydrogen bond is bonded to a very small electronegative element like nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen. In combination with these small electronegative elements, hydrogen carries a substantial 
positive charge. And so the attraction of this positive end with the negative end of another molecule will constitute a strong bond. This is the hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is about 5 to 10 times stronger than ordinary dipole-dipole interaction. It is not as strong as ordinary covalent bond between atoms in a compound. I want to thank you for your listening and God bless you.